Welcome to Goal 10 um, uh, for the Neskowin Citizens Informational Town Hall. And we're starting off with a series of poll questions. Because as I had just explained, and I'll say again here, this town hall is part of a series that will be contributing to a citizen survey that will come out in a couple of years. So we're gonna start asking you questions that are related to this material. And so we're going to give you a series, I think it's just five questions. Um, you're gonna get them now, and then you're also gonna get them at the very end of this informational town hall. And we're asking you the exact same questions twice because we wanna see what the impact of the town hall is. <laughs> Um, that's one thing that we're, we're investigating, okay? So the best way to answer these questions, they are anonymous, right? So we don't know what you're gonna say. We are gonna ask you the questions twice if you stay till the very end. And the best thing is to don't try to guess. There are no right or wrong answers. The right answer is just how you really feel about this question now, right? So like the first question is how familiar are you with goal 10? If you're not familiar at all, then just, you know, be honest. It's, we need to know the truth. Now, if you're very familiar with it, you know, and it, don't try to make it socially acceptable answer, <laughs> right? We want the right answer. Okay, I think I've said enough now. So um, do they do one question at a time? It looks like I see two questions there. So you're gonna ask them to- Well, you, you can also scroll down. There's, there's a total of five in this series. Okay. So, okay, and they'll do it all at once. So maybe we'll give them like two minutes to do the five questions. Sure. Okay, so we'll, so please go ahead. You, you by now see it on your screen um, and go ahead and take the five questions, scroll down. I'll do it too. And uh, it's 6.07. We've had 34% who have voted, 37. Okay. Great. I'm still reading the questions, even though I know what they are. I don't know that I can vote. Well, you can not if you want to. I just want to see how it goes. I think you can, you're a citizen. Well, maybe because I'm the host, I can't vote. Remember, we're recording this and everyone's hearing what we're saying. <laughs> We should stop talking. Okay, 60%. Let's say, okay, so we'll leave another minute or so. Please go ahead and, and vote. Um, the information is important to us. So we'll wait one more minute and then we'll close it out. We're at seventy-two percent. Okay, I'm waiting. My I'm going to wait till my clock says six oh nine. Okay. Oh, there it goes. Okay, you want to? Do you, now? Are we going to see the results right away? Because we can. Do you want to do that? Or are we not taking that time? Let, let me see. Okay, okay so well, I just ended. Go ahead and close it out. Let's see what happens. Okay, I'm and sharing the results go. now. You see the results. So now you can see where you fit. And this was what seventy-two percent of the people attending and there's 37 people attending. Interesting, yeah. good. All right, so thank you so much for participating in the poll. Really appreciate that. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn um, the meeting over to our moderator, Sarah. Are you ready, Sarah Absher? I am, thank you, Brenda. Can okay, you take it away. Hi. Still working on getting close here to my screen. Great. Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see you. Uh, thank you for um, putting together this panel. This is one of my most favorite topics and definitely something um, being a lifelong resident of our county uh, I'm very concerned about and I'm very passionate about. So this evening we are talking about housing, which is uh, contained within the goal 10 element of the Tillamook County Comprehensive Plan. Uh, so what we need to think about 
when we think about housing in relation to um, the policies uh, and the aspirations outlined within the school element is creating diverse housing stock, housing stock that's accessible to all members of our community. Um, it also leaves space and recognition for um, that there could be multiple types of housing stock that is shared uh, by full-time residents, second homeowners, and others. But really the key of this is looking at making sure that Tillamook County has adequate housing for its community and that it has a diverse stock of housing that makes it affordable and accessible to everyone. It's recognized that there are areas that are appropriate for higher density zoning and areas that are not. And we see that through our low, medium and, dense, and high density zoning designations, as well as areas like rural residential lands that are outside of your communities. Uh, taking into consideration things like adequacy of public facilities like water, sewer, roads, do you have adequate public infrastructure to accommodate development? is really key to all of this. And looking also at areas that may be prone to hazards or have natural features. And one of the things that um, we are not required to do by state law as an unincorporated community, um, but we do anyway recognizing the value and importance of it is something called a buildable lands inventory. And um, I'm excited that Commissioner Scar is with us. I'm really hoping that she'll dive in a little bit into the recent study that was completed by the Housing Commission uh, with the Housing Needs Analysis that is a long overdue assessment of buildable lands and also what our projected housing needs are for unincorporated Tillamook County. Uh, there's a lot of questions about what is appropriate housing types what fits in with the character of the area, um, where is dense and um, residential infill appropriate, where is it more appropriate to have sparser residential development. Um, and those are all things that we need to consider in reviewing and assessing the NESCO and community plan and then implementing ordinances through your residential and commercial zones. Uh, Nescoen does talk about uh, goal 10 in its community plan, and it states that Nescoen has provided for a range of housing types consistent with its rural community designation. And so that's things like um, you have a lot of lots with single family dwellings, you have minimum land area requirements that also controls density within your community. You do have a diverse housing stock by way of single family dwellings and um, condominium development. But one of the things that I would ask you all to consider tonight, especially as you listen to our panelists share information with you is, is that enough? Are there gaps in the housing stock that's within the community of Nesco? And, and if so, what kind of gaps are those? Because especially in um, updating the community plan and looking at the implementing zoning ordinances for your community, this is a huge opportunity and a great moment to really look at if we wanted to add more housing stock, if we wanted to make that those housing opportunities more accessible, right? So looking at things like what's required that requires a conditional use, what's allowed outright. Is there space for things like accessory dwelling units? And that poll was just outstanding that you guys just did. That was such great information. So those are all things that I would like you to think about um, as you visit with the panelists and, and listen uh, to all of the things that they have to share tonight. So uh, without further delay, um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our first panelist. Our first panelist is Melissa Carlson Swanson. She is the branch services manager for uh, Till Tillamook County for the Oregon Food Bank. Uh, she is also a member of the Tillamook County Housing Commission. Um, so, Melissa, please introduce yourself. Welcome to um, our town hall this evening. And one of the things that I would like you to maybe consider um, about in visiting with everyone, especially in your role uh, as the branch services manager for the Oregon Food Bank, how important it is with the clients and the community that you serve to have accessible, affordable housing and have it located in areas with public services and facilities, please. Great, thank you, Sarah. 
Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Melissa Carlson Swanson. I'm the manager of the Tillamook County Food Bank. It's a branch of Oregon Food Bank. And lack of stable housing is a root cause of hunger for many Oregonians. Many households pay 50% or more on housing each month, which leaves little or nothing for other essential expenses throughout the month. More households are seeking food assistance for the first time because of the squeeze on their household budgets. Some of these families may not qualify for other assistance programs such as SNAP because their income is too high, but their income isn't high enough to cover the costs of their rents and other, other needs throughout the month. Over the last year, the links between hunger and housing have become clearer than ever. Oregonians who are renters are 10 times more likely than homeowners to experience hunger. And in 2020, a staggering 53% of renters cut back on food and medications just to be able to pay their rent. Having low inventories of rental housing available in communities drives up demand drives up the demand and rent prices even higher, creating even more untenable situations for households to endure. These experiences create chronic stress and adverse health outcomes for households in our local communities because it's very difficult for families, making it very difficult for families to survive, let alone thrive. One study recently shows that 84% of tenants in Oregon are experiencing mental or physical stress due to housing insecurity at this time. So for Tillamook County, we have very unique landscape and um, transportation routes. And we do have some very remote locations. Um, a, lot of, a lot of that is not build buildable. Um, but what we find is that folks, the farther you work from your, where you live, the costs go up significantly because you have to have a reliable vehicle, some type of transportation, which costs insurance, the vehicle costs, maintenance, all of those things. Child care, we also have a child care <laughs> crisis in our community. And so um, being closer to those town centers where most of the employment is located, having those things close by, helps folks that are lower income have a chance to succeed in our um, communities. And so considering places, that's, al that's also where a lot of the um, availability of being able to build would be is, is more, um, we want to make sure that there's accessibility for services and um, not creating a burden for additional travel. Thank you, Melissa. Um, one more follow-up question, please. So, um, how do you think long-term rentals and accessory dwelling units can help with the need for workforce housing and local housing in general? So are these, um, especially looking at accessory dwelling units and other types of housing opportunities in Nescoan? What do you think, what do you think would be the most impactful for the community to consider if they were to look at zoning revisions for their residential zones? Well, I do believe that first of all, we'd be addressing inventory in the county and um, having accessibility to places of seasonal work in the tourism industry. And as we do see the inventory increase we're going to reduce the amount of stress on individuals in our communities and more involvement in the community, more engagement in schools and other community type activities. ADUs are an interesting solution because it not only provides the opportunity to increase housing and um, allow families to become housed but it also allows for an additional income source for some of our residents as well. So it can also be seen as an economic development opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Melissa? I have a question. Okay, Phil. Sorry. Um, so in our area, how many housing units are we short, right? You know, to support the need, you know, it, 
it sounds like you've done an assessment of available building lots or lo you know locations, but how many people are we talking about? I mean, there's the, there's the issue of just price, right? Cost of housing, but as you said, supply will help, hopefully will help with that issue a little bit. So can you quantify how many structures or how many building units or EDUs are needed to, to make a difference? I'll defer to Sarah for those specific numbers. Great, thank you. Um, so Phil, that's a great question. Um, I'm actually, so I know Commissioner Scar, uh, that's actually a great segue to um, her visiting with the group and to talk about the housing needs analysis. Uh, so I'd like to um, introduce Commissioner Aaron Scar. Uh, prior to being elected County Commissioner, Aaron was the Executive Director of CARE, which is our local community action resource enterprise. Is that right, Commissioner? That is correct. Thank you. So Commissioner, um, while you answer that question, I actually have another one that I think would be a great question talking about what our housing needs are. There was a question that was posted in the chat to go along with this. Um, and basically what it is, is in relation to high price real estate property in Nescoen, um, for increasing housing density or low cost housing, uh, why, would it, why would we do that in Nescoen when there, are, when there is far more affordable land available elsewhere in Tillamook County and nearby? I think that's an excellent question. And I think you are the perfect person to answer that. <laughs> well, um, I'm actually going to start with that because I think that uh, Melissa sort of hit on some of the key pieces around that, which really has to do with we would like to have and it's healthier for our communities when the people who work in our communities can live in our communities. So in terms of why Nesco in, um, South County has a large seasonal tourist business um, and having part of those folks be permanent residents and a part of Nesco Inn has a lot of enrichment opportunities for our community. So I think that's important. I think the other piece is that our workforce, which uh, a lot of our workforce that are in the tourism industry, uh, when we put them in the areas that have more affordable land, that means Tillamook. So now you have them driving really from Tillamook to work in South County. So there's a piece of that there, which is just, if we wanna have healthy, vibrant communities all up and down the coast, we would have all types of housing and all types of folks um, spread throughout. So I think uh, Ness kind of hit on that. And, and I would say that's for me, the big answer as to why Ness go in, because I think you're absolutely correct that it is more difficult to create workforce housing in communities that don't, um, that are predominantly vacation homes or second homes and typically have homes that are um, larger and uh, often have zoning code, which will be Sarah's piece of this conversation um, that doesn't really support density, therefore makes it very difficult to build affordably. So um, let's kind of answer the first question, but I wanna back up just a little bit and talk about the housing needs analysis. I wanna talk about Kind of how we got to this point very briefly and then give you some numbers to answer the other questions around well how many do we need and at what levels and what kinds and all of that because that's really um, a great great question as well so we have been working on the housing the housing issues in tillamook county um, as as a county body since 2015 the initial housing task force was started in 2015 and that group was brought together. It was just a broad cross section of folks from different walks of life to look at our housing situation and say, we keep hearing anecdotally that there's a problem. What is the real problem? What do we have? What do we need? And why don't we have what we need? Isn't this just something where, you know, the, the free market will balance what we, what we need with what we have? And that first housing study dug in and said, well, not exactly that that study indicated that we were somewhere between probably 600 and 800 housing units short of what we needed in the county. Um, and that really there, the reason that it, the free market, so to speak, didn't solve it, really had to do with Tillamook County sort of having two housing markets. 
There's one along the coast, which Nescawin is included in for the most part. There's some inland parts of Nescawin as well in your community planning area. But really the coastal market is your um, vacation home, second home, retirement home um, sort of community. And there are a lot of houses in that community. There's a lot of development in that community. There's a pretty good buy and sell in that community. Um, this study came out in 2017. So I realized that things may have tightened up a bit since then. But really it said that that coastal market was pretty healthy housing market. Lots of investment, lots of turnover, good things happening there. But there's a secondary housing market for Tillamook County and that they classified as largely the inland area housing markets. And those markets on the other hand, were not having the investment in them that we were seeing on the coastal side. So the inland housing market is more of where your affordable and attainable housing is. And we use that word because affordable often to people means subsidized housing. There's a really specific meaning and that isn't, that isn't the only thing we're talking about. The first study also identified that we needed all kinds of housing um, for all different levels of our workforce. So that inland market is where we would expect to find that, that sort of more affordable and attainable housing but the inland market is super stagnant. People are not investing in, in housing in near the numbers. And Sarah could probably talk about that from permitting numbers, but just not investing in that um, more full-time workforce market. So that was the first study. And that gave us some good information and good, good opportunity to get out in the community and talk about what was becoming a housing crisis and to have some numbers to put underneath it. Out of the first housing study came the formation of the Housing Commission, which is the official body um, of the county that again has a broad spectrum of representation and the Housing Commission's job is to advise the commissioners on changes that can be made in the county and specifically focusing on unincorporated county and communities, what changes can be made in our zoning code in um, gosh, various other things like property tax abatement and, and tools that we can put in place to make that, um, make the housing market move, to try to make it more desirable for uh, developers and try to make it more affordable to build. Okay, so that's kind of the housing commission is looking at that piece of it. How do we encourage workforce housing? Well, one of the, the, the other pieces the housing commission did was, was to get a second study done. And the second study is, a more specific on the ground, exactly how many units do we need, exactly what kind of housing would we uh, want to have, and to some degree, a bit of the spread of where maybe it should go and where is the land available for it, because it included, the study included a buildable lands inventory specific to the unincorporated areas of Tillamook County, and then in partnership with some of the cities that chose to come on board, their buildable lands inventory was included in this second more specific study. And I invite you, if you're interested, there's a lot of information in both studies and both of them are available, I believe, on the Housing Commission's webpage, which is under community development. There's a specific Housing Commission page. So that gives you some quick background. And if you want to dig into these numbers yourself, I invite you to do so. It is, I think, a fairly digestible study, although it has a lot of numbers. So what I will, I'm gonna just give um, some of the numbers I think are, are most critical to this conversation. So the question was asked, uh, well, how many housing units do we actually need in Tillamook County? So this study did a look at two things. One of them was pent up housing demand. So when you look at the population that is in Tillamook County currently, and you look at the, um, the money they make, therefore the jobs they're likely to be in, the types of housing they are likely to be able to afford um, and kind of, kind of compare that to what we have. And they came up with what they considered the gap in housing. Um, and that was the first number that we, that we looked at was just what do we need today? If there was zero population growth, if, if we could just put some gates up at the edge and say, if you're here, you're here, if you're not, you're not, and everybody should have a house they can afford. That was the first, the first run of numbers that we looked at. Um, and in doing so, I think the existing market gap uh, for houses ended up being 660, I can't find that number in its totality, um, around 650 houses. 
Okay, and those are kind of spread across workforce housing. Um, so low, very low income housing, workforce housing, and what we would consider kind of missing middle, which includes your, you know, your professionals, um, everything up to, but not including vacation homes. Okay, so there's about 650 in what we call pent up demand. So if we could just house everybody, that's where we would be. But for this housing study, we knew that wasn't enough. We also had to do the forward growth projections because you all are doing your community plan now, and this is a three plus year project. So we know that during the time that you are doing your work and everyone else in the county is doing their work, population is growing, need is growing, um, and we will need more homes. So we actually did a scenario that included the 20 year growth as well. So there's pent up demand, plus there's what we expect to see in the next 20 years. And those are the full numbers that I will give you. So for the Tillamook County 20 year housing forecast scenario, um, they say that we will end up needing 2,730 more units of housing across the entire county. So that's a lot, 2,730 units across the entire county. Now, what's important to recognize is that that is all units of housing. That includes the additional vacation and second homes that we need as well, because their projection looks to see what we have built in the past. It looks at what the gap is, and then it projects out into the future what, what is going to be needed and what our usage will be. So I think the part of that that um, is probably interesting to you all is you think, well, we're unincorporated county. Shouldn't we put most of the houses in the cities? Um, their, their total for what the unincorporated counties would actually hold is 1,119 dwellings. That's obviously not all in Escalin, but that's across the entire unincorporated county area, okay? Um, the other piece that's interesting, I think, when you look at uh, how it relates to Nescawin, they did do the buildable lands inventory. They did take a look at um, the, zone, the development areas in each of the unincorporated parts of the county um, and looked at how many acres were available um, in each of, those, uh, each of those areas to decide sort of, okay, well, where might things be put? Um, and I'm looking at the table on page 28, if any of you, you know, have pulled it up and are looking. Uh, but when they did that, they said, okay, well, looking at the land that's there, how is it currently zoned? Is it zoned for very low density, low density, medium density, and high density? And what is the total, uh, total acres? So when they did that with Nescawin, they said 235 acres are zoned for very low density. 158 acres are zoned for low density. Two are zoned for medium density and zero for high density. So that's your current community plan uh, zoning uh, as it sits today, that out of the 395 acres that are there, you currently have zero in high density, okay? But you do have 395 acres. So when we look across the county, this number struck me when I was um, looking at, at the report, and you look at the other communities, such as Neatarts, Oceanside, Pacific City, Wheeler, um, these are the urban growth areas around Wheeler, um, the Halem, uh, looking at the UGB around Manzanita. Um, the Halem has 345 acres, and they're the closest one to you. Everybody else has fewer. So that struck me. Um, as you all said, why Nesca win? Um, it's an interesting piece that you all have some of the most available land in the unincorporated communities within a community plan area, as I understand it. So Sarah can correct me if I'm interpreting that incorrectly, but it looks to me from, from the study, and again, I invite everyone to take a look. This is page 28. If you pull up the housing needs analysis, uh, either as we're talking or later, um, you have some of the most available land uh, within our communities in the unincorporated areas. So Sarah, are there other things that you were hoping I would hit on out of the study? Those were the things that struck me um, just sort of as I look through it. No, Commissioner, I think that's great. Um, just to add a little bit more context to what, you're, to what you shared. And um, 
So I just want to preface this. I don't want this conversation to steer it in a, in a, in a direction that's not uh, housing related or that gets more into a focus of short term rentals, but there, there is something that I think that is important to add some perspective onto. Um, so the first one, the number of housing units that Commissioner Scar is referring to, those are for people who live and work here. So that number is going to compete with a lot of second homeowners, it's going to compete with transient lodging. And to give you some perspective on that, um, the numbers for uh, dwelling units approved in uh, 2020. So we approved roughly 110 new dwelling units countywide. We also brought on 93 new short-term rentals in 2020 countywide. So there will be you know, when we talk about these dwelling units, it doesn't maybe seem like a lot to some people if you just do the straight math of dividing that number of housing units over 20 years. But what is missing from that conversation is the situation that we all know of is that long-term, long-term rental residential housing stock is going to compete and have to compete with several factors that could make it challenging to actually attain that number and meet that goal. The other thing that I think is important to note, um, touching on a few points that both Commissioner Scar and Melissa shared with us earlier, um, there is no city between Tillamook and Lincoln City. So there's a 45 mile stretch and that's really something to think about we talk about, well, where should housing go? Well, maybe it is more, you know, appropriate in the city. Think about how many people work and live between Tillamook and Lincoln City. That's a lot of folks. Um, and those are people who desperately need housing. Um, so just, just a couple of things to add a little bit of a deeper context to um, those figures that Commissioner Scar provided. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Commissioner Scarb before we move on to our third panelist? Or Chris, do you want to read some of them? Out of, there's a couple in the chat. Did you want to uh, touch on any of those? Looks like there's a lot uh, of conversation we, in there. <laughs> yeah, I know you. I know you touched on a, a, some of them. Um, one question that came in is, has the community, has any community limited ADU use to long-term housing only and not short-term? So I could actually take that one. Take that one. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, as many of you may recall, because you've been lifelong residents of Nescoin as well, is um, that uh, there was an effort to pass an accessory dwelling unit ordinance in 2010. And um, that effort, along with uh, future efforts that may be considered by the county commissioners at the recommendation of the Housing Commission, would prohibit ADUs from being converted into short-term rentals. That's something that uh, was Senate Bill 1510, which was a bill that was passed uh, in a previous legislative session that required cities to um, allow outright one ADU on a property within their urban growth areas that is something where um, I've seen within our local area, uh, cities uh, add that stipulation to prohibit ADUs from being um, converted or used into short-term rentals. And that will be my recommendation moving forward um, if and when that proposal is brought forward to the commissioners, so. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, another question came in is probably, um, for Melissa, is there an estimate of how many current residents of Nesquin are regular clients of the food bank? I do know that folks that live around the Nesquin Pacific City area have um, many choose to go to the Lincoln City uh, pantries. And so that is outside of our service area. I do not know those uh, numbers. Um, we do have the Pacific City uh, food pantry that would most likely be the place that folks would go to. And we are currently serving roughly 20, it's been 20 to 40 households um, during the pandemic. Thanks, Melissa. 
Uh, Sarah, a question came in from Guy. Um, are the 393 acres in low and very low density zones within, Nes within the Nesquin community boundary? There's a good portion of those, yes, that are. Um, the very low density is going to be your Nesco and rural residential zone. And then um, the low density is the Nesco and R1 zone. Um, one thing I think that's important to note in there that is pertinent to this conversation this evening is um, the Nesco and coastal hazards overlay zone. So when you look at that zoning designation and how that falls within, I think it goes, it extends a little bit past Breakers Boulevard, just to give everybody a visual of where that is. Um, it touches most of the lots on the east side of Breakers uh, through the village. Um, there are some density prohibitions and restrictions there uh, for our one zone properties or um, law, um, excuse me, land divisions uh, potential, et cetera. So commissioner, I don't know if you, I do not have that study in front of me. Do you wanna clarify on that? But I believe that most of that is within the Nesco and core area. The way I read the table, yes, that would be, it would be within that, so. Sarah, this is Guy. So to, just to help clarify for me, a Nesco and R1 is considered a low density lot. Correct. So when that when you look at that table on 28, you could have a 50 by 100 lot that zone Nesco and R1. And in this study, it would be considered low density. Correct. So you've got you've got two two layers there. So the, the first layer is you've got um, lawfully created lots of record that were platted prior to the creation implementation of our land use program. So many of the lots, especially if you think about the village area, village proper, um, most of those lots were platted at the turn of the century or shortly thereafter. And so they're obviously below the minimum property size requirement. All of the uses still would continue to apply. That was the that was the designation that was applied. Um, I want to say the R1. So it was changed to Nesco and R1 when the first uh, community plan and implementing zoning ordinances were adopted. But prior to that in the ordinance that was in effect from 1981 through the, uh, until the adoption of the current zoning, it was still designated as R1 and it still had the minimum property size requirement of 7,500 square feet, even though existing development as it had been platted obviously allowed for much less. I guess my point is that that's a pretty misleading number representing Nesco and compared to the other unincorporated communities, but we go on. So I would just say, just to kind of close out my piece of this, um, Tillamook County is definitely challenged because we have so much farm and forest land, which is appropriately and rightly preserved. So we really have to look within all of our areas that have the ability to add some form of additional housing to add some additional housing for our workforce if we're going to have the impact that we want to have which is to encourage those who work in our communities to live in our communities and to to really contribute to that vitality and that depth um, at the same time communities all have personalities and cultures that that they want to and should be able to hang on to and I encourage you all as you move forward in this plan and look at and think about what might density look like that is appropriate and fitting in our community might it be duplexes might it be fourplexes might it be the ADUs are there ways that we could willingly change what zoning requires in order to allow for those two duplexes and fourplexes um, to increase the amount of housing that's that's available. It, it's possible to do it uh, without having to um, 
take away from the culture and, and the feel of the community that you love. I think it can really deepen that. So I encourage you to think about things. I know a lot of times when people hear density, they immediately think apartment buildings or they immediately think, um, you know, that's gonna ruin our community because it's gonna look weird, right? Um, recognizing that there can be some amazing fourplexes that from the front look like a home that's just like every other home, except there happen to be four doors and there's four apartments in it. So it doesn't have to change the look of your communities. It doesn't have to change what you see as that really critical, um, just, you know, there's a certain feel that you want that goes with a lot of the architectural development and knowing that you can add some density and keep that is important. So I think just being open-minded and, and open to the fact that Nescawin can play an important role without having to suddenly change everything to density and have apartment buildings, but rather can, can create this opportunity uh, for folks. And I'm seeing somebody says more units doesn't necessarily equate to affordable housing. So what we're working on at the Housing Commission are changes that can make it more viable to make those rents affordable for developers who are willing to put four units because that is density and it does make it more affordable. If one person has to make the payment for that home, it's, it's much higher than if you can split it between four apartments. So uh, again, it may, it may not seem like it's a huge thing, um, but boy, it can make a big difference in keeping the workforce that you want for your businesses and to have in your community down in your area. So I just encourage you to, to attend, come to this open-mindedly. I'm sure that Sarah uh, has probably could bring some great examples of the types of housing that I'm talking about or cottage clusters is something that has been talked about a lot for some of our coastal communities that would fit right in, would look fabulous and would be more affordable to those who work there. So. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, and that's something, especially as we continue to work through community plan updates and um, consider some zoning amendments. Those are all great design tools and standards that can be considered, um, especially if a community is willing to look at some creative designs that would um, help bring in housing in a way that doesn't compromise the character of the area. Uh, so, okay, well, so moving on to our third panelist. Thank you, Commissioner Scar. Uh, our third panelist with us this evening uh, is uh, one of uh, one of your own residents within Nescoin, uh, Susan Amort. Susan is the managing principal broker for Windermere West LLC in Pacific City. So welcome, Susan. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I also have a question for you uh, as part of um, your visit with the community this evening. How, in your opinion, do you think that the balance of the requirements of goal 10, which would be to create and promote diverse accessible housing options within the Nesco and community. Do you think that that's possible um, given the lotting patterns within uh, and the existing development within the community already? And as your professional experience as a realtor, what types of ideas do you think the community could consider for creative design ideas? Wow, I, I wish I had thought about that before I'm um, on the screen. Um, well, I, what I did do is I went back and kind of looked at the history over the last number of years, um, how many homes have sold, how many lots have sold. And, and some of the numbers that I think I heard um, earlier sound, you know, I mean, at the moment we've got 40 active lots for sale. Um, anywhere from 150,000 to a half a million, um, depending on where it's located. Um, just quickly, in uh, from 2012 to 2016, um, we sold anywhere from 14 houses per year to 24 houses per year. We, you know, we haven't always had a great inventory. I know when I first built my house in the 90s, it was hard to even find a vacant lot to buy. Um, so, you know, the outskirts, you know, do, you know, we've had some new development since then, but I think in certainly in, in the core area, there's, there's not very, 
you know, 2021 has created some real housing shortage here for resales. At the moment, we have three houses for sale. Um, and in one of them sold for about 574 years ago and it's now listed for over nine. And so it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a tough market here at the moment. Um, and in, from 2011 to 2016, um, we, the average price per a single family house was 383,000. And at any of those given years, we sold anywhere from 14 to 24 houses. Um, from 2017 to 2021 currently, um, we've got, I mentioned three, but the, um, the average um, listing now or the average sale price is, is, is much, much higher than it, than it was before. Um, at the moment, I think our um, average from 2020 to 21 is of 631,000 for sale um, as, a, as a selling price. So, um, and I think the, the availability of lots, and you were talking about some of the lots in the core, there's one um, right down the street and it's listed for $250,000. And it's in that coastal hazard zone, which as Sarah knows, we've found out there's a long list of things you have to do to be able to build a home, which um, in some cases is good because it's gonna protect the area, but in other, it's, it's insurmountable to, to try and meet all of the requirements. Um, and especially in the coastal hazard zone, you have to put the house on pilings. Um, we have one example of that where the Wilson, the old Wilson house was. And so, and it cost about $35,000 to do that, depending on how far down you have to go with your pilings. So, I mean, just the cost of development is, in, is really high. Um, and depending on where the vacant lots are, if they're north or they're on the east side, um, you know, most of the available lots, which I think I mentioned, we've got about 40, um, they're all very steep and very expensive to build on. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't really think of a section, and Sarah would, would know better than me, I haven't really thought about it, about workforce housing and, and multiple dwellings, you know, apartments or a fourplex, um, you know, that's not allowed here in the village, I don't believe. So, um, and in South Beach, they have very few lots um, over there. So um, I just, and, and I think workforce housing is tough. I think a lot of the people who work in Pacific City um, and, 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 or, you know, they live in, or they, you know, they live in Lincoln City. Um, Pacific City probably has a lot more property, but still it's single family and, and those homes with ocean views are gonna go for a half a million dollars and that's not very affordable to people. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of what I pulled up just on the sales and, and what I saw going, but, but, the, but the medium price of a house here has, has uh, you know, not quite doubled um, over the years. And, um, and it'd be nice to see some new construction, but uh, Viking Estates comes to mind, which is a cute neighborhood that um, a developer from Portland I got to work with, or from Salem, got to work with a couple years ago, built the cutest little houses you've ever seen. And they flew off the shelf, they built three of them, and I think they've built two more. But it's the only neighborhood in Neskowin where you can have a manufactured home, that it's allowed. And um, there's probably, I think there's about 30 lots up there. One of the issues is the water. The water line has to be replaced um, and that infrastructure. And so we were only able to do a few of them. Um, but I know the folks that bought all the lots and I think they've got some plans and I'm sure they've probably reached out to Sarah. Um, but that neighborhood is probably a really good option for some workforce housing that if you could do a duplex or you know something on those lots um it's on the east side they the three we built were had ocean views um but it it's probably a a nice option if if something can be worked out you know with those with those landowners because i think it is a good 
it's a good option. So I can chime in for a second. I think uh, one of the things that, that we have talked about a little bit in the Housing Commission, I hope that we would think about is it sounds like if there's a water line issue, you know, it's one of those that, you know, can the county step in and do something to help with an infrastructure piece with the, with the requirement then being that a certain piece of that becomes some form of, of workforce housing. You know, I mean, I think these are the kind of creative partnerships. The first um, study talked a lot about public private partnership and how you can take something that would otherwise perhaps be unaffordable or, you know, you couldn't do it. But if you can bring that public component into it, and I look at it and say with community development block grants and other resources that the county can make available, can we partner with someone if you know, yeah. a private landowner up there and say, great, you know, if we're willing to help with the infrastructure, can we have more houses, this many, however many that would be, that would be affordable for the workforce. So I think those kind of be thinking in those ways for all of us to say, when we normally would stop and say, well, it's just not possible because, well, let's think about that because for a minute and let's think about how we might be able to change some of those parameters to make yeah. it affordable. So, and there will well, certainly always be things we can't change, right? Yeah. Like the $250,000 lot, that's just, you know, it's not gonna happen and that's okay because yeah. there is a projected need for more second homes and vacation homes as well, right? So that will continue to grow and they will naturally take those more expensive lots. But if we can tweak the market a little bit in some areas by allowing, again, smaller setbacks or whatever it takes to get a little greater density and to help with infrastructure if that's going to make a difference. So well, and the, to think and, yeah, and the one thing about Viking and because the sewer doesn't go up there, they were in the sewer district and it was rather, there was no way the sewer district was going to be able to run a, a, a line for a mile. And, and we've got to, you know, cover the lots that are within the village and, and on the other side of the road that are within our district. So um, I think, you know, they, I don't think they've gotten out of the district. I know Pacific Overlook did because it just wasn't feasible for us to run the lineup. But one of the things is each home, unless you can do a shared system, uh, you put one of those Advantix septic systems and it's as expensive as sewer. I mean, it's $20,000. And so it, it, the, you know, cha-ching, cha-ching. I mean, just, you know, it keeps adding on. And, and I will say the builders that did those homes, they put nice, they put, you know, reasonable finishes in them, nice siding. And if you haven't driven up there, you should. I mean, it really, it's like a little village. And um, I think they're going to put a park in one area that um, they took out an old manufactured home. But um, anyway, that's, uh, that's my two cents. Thank you, Susan. Hey, Susan, Thank what do you think it would take to um, improve that infrastructure up there in Viking Estates so that we could add more um, lower income housing? Well, it, it'd be good to talk to the water department. I know that one of the issues um, was that just, it was a really, I mean, Viking Estates was built in the 60s. And I think the pipe going down from there down, is it Tibbetts to where Pacific uh, Hills of Neskowin is, um, they needed to replace that line. And I think they, um, may not have budgeted for, you know, a lot of, because there wasn't any development going on up there. And, and so, you know, I think that that line is really important to the, to furthering, to get the rest of those lots built up there. And, and I'm sure the developers would love to talk with the county and the water department and, and see, uh, I, I haven't talked to them, you know, in a number of months. And so um, I know they just built two and sold one right away. So um, anyway, I don't, and I see Troy is on the is on the list. So he might be able to, to add something about the water because I don't know what this current status is with them. Troy, go ahead, take yourself off mute. There you go. Okay, all right. Oh, uh, just an update from the water district. That was our very last project that we've completed 
we completed it last summer in really in earnest in July. Um, so Viking Estates has adequate fire flow and infrastructure for water now. Um, it was the very last project that we completed. I don't know if that helps everybody, but. Well, that's good yeah. to know. Yeah, so there's no, no issues with building that I know of, at least on the water infrastructure side in Viking Estates. Yeah. So, um, so one of the um, things that I really liked about Viking Estates, Susan is correct. Uh, Chris Keola, who is the county's environmental program manager or our sanitarian, which is a, a shorter, shorter title for him. Uh, he and I actually visited quite extensively with the um, developers who purchased this uh, area, this development several years ago, or a couple of years ago. It seems like it's been a while. But one of the things, you know, going back to things about creative design ideas or talking and thinking about how can we make it happen? How can we make it happen responsibly where we're working with the water district and potentially the sewer district or with you know Chris in our office or others um, because Commissioner Scar is right I think if we start piling on all of the things that will help determine why it may not happen or be able to happen and start instead of just identifying things and challenges and going well how how can we overcome that what can help remove that barrier or remove that challenge to make it happen and one of the really great things that happened with Viking Estates that made that project happen was they were willing to give up some of the platted lots to build septic systems. And so they did a series of property line adjustments and easements because they do have to have septic and those lots are small, right? So they're in the Nescalin RR zone and um, I believe there's a 20,000 square foot minimum property size requirement in that zone. But again, these are pre-platted lots. Um, and I think they're roughly about half of that size, a little bit less. Well, we sat down with them and it was, how do we, how do we make this happen? Because we can't develop it as it is because all of those lots individually will not be able to accommodate a home and a system. So we sat down and started talking about how lines could be adjusted and yeah, they lost a few lots, but now they have houses instead of a dormant, vacant, empty property that if somebody wasn't willing to kind of think about, okay, how can we make this work? We wouldn't, maybe we wouldn't have anything there at all. And then that got the ball rolling and now they have a nice new water line. And one day there may be funding available for a sewer line as well. But in the meantime, they found a way to make it work which was really exciting. They found those solutions they needed. Thank you, Sarah. So are we at a point where um, we can wrap this up and launch our, our last series of polling questions? All right. Hearing none, I think I think we'll go ahead and do that then. So let me launch the uh, next series of polling questions. I did tailor the questions a little bit, um, and here they go. You should see them momentarily. So if you could just spend a minute or two answering those, uh, really would appreciate that. Well, everyone's doing the poll, Chris. I must admit, um, I may be part of the failure in response to number two. Um, if uh, I, I, we didn't really talk about that as much as uh, we could have. So that's certainly something we can circle back around if folks feel like they want to talk more about the existing zone, current zoning. And Sarah, there was a question that came up in the chat um, about a 
affordable multifamily dwelling in the village that was raised and replaced with a single family home. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how long ago that that happened, but my guess is that, you know, the, the property owner could build whatever they they want as long as it was within the uh, fit in with the zoning requirements. That is correct, Chris. Thank you. Um, you know, and that's something we see um, either through gentrification, which drives up real estate prices, or just desirable lots, especially if they're oceanfront, where a structure that maybe did have multiple dwelling units has been torn down for a larger dwelling. But it's allowed. Right. Mm -hmm. Sarah and Chris, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, when we were first coming to Nesquin, I know uh, Lainey was able to rent as a school teacher. She was able to rent a place in the village. And um, there were places around town that you could work locally and live in the village. Uh, those have disappeared to a great degree. There's still a few there, but that kind of there has been a presence of people who worked here tucked into nooks and crannies in Nesquin over the decades. And that's, that is a part of who this community is already. It may be have disappeared more, but um, it's there. People have been here and they have lived here and worked on and had local wages and been able to live here. But um, just wanted to add that historical <laughs> perspective to low cost housing in the village. Thanks, Ryan. All right, so the polls closed. Um, we had about 80% um, respondents. So I went ahead and shared the results for everybody to see. And no real surprises there, at least to me. Well, I, I think okay. that's a great response. All right. Um, Sarah, Brenda, does anybody want to wrap this up? I just want to, well, I want to thank everyone for coming and attending. Remember, this is just one in a series. And um, I will give it back to you, Ran or Chris or Sarah, if you want to say a final word. And there we go. Thank you, everyone. Come, come to the next one. Oh, do we have a date on the next one? We were going to be prepared. Oh, did we forget? <laughs> it's in April. Uh, it's the April. third week, third, third, third Tuesday in April, six o'clock. There you go. Yeah, so stay tuned. There'll be more information that will be coming out via email and, and posted on our website. So thanks everybody for attending. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Chris and Brenda for bringing it to us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Nice to see everyone.